Hello everyone, it's Jess Hart. Sorry I've been away, I had to do a course, and life in general has been kind of friggin' crazy and weird, but today we are building and talking about the story of Sparrow, a poor homeless orphan on the streets of Bowerstone. This story comes to us around 2008, but the story takes place in the early 1700s. Sparrow isn't the first hero to reside in Albion in which Bowerstone is set, but is definitely a great one. As you play as Sparrow, you can choose how you react to the world, with evil and malice, or love and graciousness. Either way, you as our hero will go to down with greatness. We start our story in Bowerstone Old Town, where Sparrow and their older sister Rose are warming themselves by a fire in the snow. Rose and Sparrow look up at the castle Fairfax and Rose talks sadly about how they would be so warm inside and probably eating roast at this time of year. They then make their way down an alleyway by their shelter to see what the big commotion is, to find a travelling trader named Murgo, a swindler with a very fancy top hat. A crowd gathers and he claims that most of his items are magical and that he has a magic mirror that for as long as you look into it, it will make you beautiful. As a man yells out that he will take it, Murgo quickly adds that the mirror's magic only will work under complete darkness. Yeah, okay. But Mergo proceeds to talk about a magic box and that if you turn the handle three times, you're granted a single wish. Rose, completely against the idea, says that there's no such thing as magic and then enters a mysterious cloaked woman from the shadows, Teresa, a blind woman who encourages the orphans to buy the magic box and that they will never know if they do not try. Sparrow and Rose proceed to run around Old Town collecting warrants for the deputy who hopelessly lost them for a gold piece as well as helping other people around the area, unless you choose to instead, of course, help the bandits that also offer gold in exchange for doing bad deeds, like handing them the warrants. The thing about Fable is that your decisions impact the people and the world around you. Bowstone, Old Town, if you decide to give the warrants for the arrest to the bandits, will turn into a crime and poverty-ridden sector of Bowstone. But if you don't, it will prosper because life is that easy. When Rose and Sparrow make up the gold pieces, they go along and finally purchase that music box. They run along back down the alleyway and place the box down on an old crate. They turn the handle and as they do, the box begins to glow. And with that, it's gone. Rose distraught says it's time to go to bed, only we meet another friend. Earlier on in the day, we save a dog from a little idiot who is attacking the poor thing. Anyway, the dog rocks up to the orphan's shelter and curls up beside them to go to sleep. Further on into the night, the orphans are woken up by the guards. Lord Lucian of Castle Fairfax has specifically requested for the orphans to come to the castle. And, you know, of course they go. Rose is now certain that their wish came true. They reach the castle and Lord Lucian's butler greets them. As you walk down a long corridor to Lucian's study, the butler tells him not to mention Lucian's wife and daughter as they had recently died. But during so, a mysterious man with glowing tattoos walks past them. Master Garth. Remember him for later. As the orphans meet Lucian, he begins to tell them about his studies and if they help him with them, he can arrange for them to live in a castle. Maybe that one. He requests the orphans to stand in a circle by the large stained glass window. As they do, a circle of blue light surrounds them. Breathlessly, Lucian exclaims that it's real and that they really are heroes. He tries to touch the wall of light, but it shocks him and it turns red. He says, what are you? As he scurries back to his books and says that the orphans aren't one of the three heroes he needs, but that one of them is the fourth. Rose, upset, asks what is happening, only for him to snap at her to be quiet. He pulls out a pistol and exclaimed, it isn't what he wanted, but that nothing must stand in his way. He shoots little Rose and she falls to the ground. Lucian turns to Sparrow, he cannot allow you to live either, and that he's sorry. Backing away, Sparrow is shot and in slow motion flies through the stained glass window and falls from the tower, hitting roofs along the way and eventually hitting the snow-covered cobblestone. In the distance, we see Teresa, the hooded woman, and the dog walking towards Sparrow as she whispers, Death is not your destiny today, little Sparrow. A cutscene plays and Teresa narrates how Lucian disappeared from the castle that night and that some grief can be so great that even death may keep its distance. Sparrow was taken to the gypsy camp out of Bowerstone, this one, and slowly life came back their body. And that over the 10 years after the incident, Sparrow's pain turned to strength, a will to change the world and to avenge the death that still haunts their every dream. Deep sh** day. We then meet Teresa as Sparrow, a newly young adult with her faithful companion, the dog. 
Teresa tells you to go to your caravan and collect some belongings like, like a sword, a crossbow, health potions, yada yada, and meet her at the massive gate of the entrance to the gypsy camp. As you meet her, you walk a while and she gives you one of your most valuable possessions, the guild seal. It enables Teresa to contact you from afar and lock the Heroes Guild. Cool story about the Heroes Guild, but anyway, you set off on your first quest to reach the Heroes Guild, which was flourishing over 500 years ago until it burned. Across from the gypsy camp, you make your way down into a cave in the middle of Bower Lake. You come across a massive room with paintings on the walls, and it reveals your ancestor, the one you play as in the first game, and all of their trials and tribulations. But that's a story for another time. Teresa tells you to step into the light and you start to levitate. This is when your will, or magic, is awakened. Boom bop, you can now raise the dead now. But we make our way as Sparrow back through Bower Lake on our way to Bowerstone, only to find that the guards have blocked off the path and that Thag, a bandit leader, is running amok and that no one gets through till he's dead. Guess who gets to behead him? Your first boss battle. Woohoo! You make your way down to the bandit camp on the outskirts of Bower Lake and wave after wave of bandits hit you and honestly it's the best time playing that every time I restart Fable 2. It's like a welcome back I guess. Thag the bandit leader ends up kicking your dog so you know he's gotta die. You kick his ass and behead him and then you come across a choice. There are two gypsies in a cage in this bandit camp. You can free them or you can sell them to a bandit who supposedly bought these gypsies, I'm not sure. Of course I freed them because I have a great moral standing, thank you very much honey. But that's another moral choice. We can finally make our way to Boundstone, the big city. We meet a super annoying bard that honestly is very wholesome and he pretty much serves as this is a clock tower, this is a blacksmith, grocer, the pub. Oh yeah, you can work as a blacksmith by the way. Also you can like serve pints at the pub, chop wood later on, become a hitman, it's a whole shindig. But anyway. When when Teresa finally meets you under the clock tower in the middle of Bowstone Square, she talks about how everyone has memories, a life, families, friends, and we just ended all of that for all of those bandits, even they had a life. She asks you if you feel the weight of responsibility yet. And yes, you can respond. I always admire how they ask this in the game. You and Teresa walk down an alleyway and look at the spire. The tattered spire was a hub for all of the will in Albion. All of the magic floated around back in the days of the old kingdom. It holds so much power that it can even grant wishes. And how Lucian is rebuilding it. Can we guess why? The last time the spire was at its peak, a wish was granted for the world of Albion to be completely destroyed in the hopes that a better world would rise from the ashes. Teresa goes on to show you her cards that she used to see, I suppose. It reveals that Sparrow, the hero that holds all the power, will, skill and strength, needs to recruit the singular heroes of skill, will and strength, and that she has a heading. In a faraway town named Oakfield, Sister Hannah, who is a member of the Temple of Light, is the hero of strength. Only there's an issue. She's a pacifist. It's Sparrow's job to recruit her. Of course, Sparrow agrees. But you know, you can bum around Bowerstone for a little while, do some flag quests, and then finally venture back to where you grew up with Rose, Bowerstone, Old Town. The guard who gave you the job at the beginning to collect the warrants remembers you. He tells you that you have a discount at all the stalls in the Old Town and that the offer extends to your sister, Rose. I am also crying, but this is only if you choose to do the good thing at the beginning. If you don't, Old Town turns to crap. You travel through Rookridge, knocking off bandits left and right, finally coming to Oakfield, which is probably my second favourite location. It's a beautiful country village with rolling hills filled with flowers and vegetables. There's a mill and a tavern, but when you reach the Temple of Light, you're offered a job to escort Sister Hannah through the temple to collect the holy water. It's annoying as heck, not gonna lie, but her father, the head dude at the Temple of Light, the abbot, depending on how well known you are as a hero, will either tell you to do some quests to raise renown or he will tell you to immediately go out and help Sister Hannah. So yes, side quests are definitely a thing in Fable, but I don't reckon I'll be talking about those in a lot of detail because this video would be crazy long and crazy boring. But we're gonna do the jug through a cave thing. Well, we just gotta make sure Sister Hannah is safe whilst doing so. So yeah, by the way, Hannah is a, like a massive lady. She is like part giant almost, I swear. And she wants the action, you know, the fighting action. Don't get any ideas. But once again, she is a monk. The whole purpose of the water in the jug thing is that they can use the holy water from the cave to water the golden magic acorn. It only appears every 100 years and it's important to plant it for the rest of the land to remain fertile. 
We venture towards the entrance to the cave to finally meet Hannah. And her nickname is Hammer, by the way, for obvious reasons. She doesn't like it at the beginning, though. As you make your way through the cave together, you meet another enemy. My favourite, Holloman. Corpses, skeletons, reanimated by wisps, souls who have not moved on, I believe. Very satisfying to kill. But shit starts to get real when we reach the last chamber. A monk alerts Hannah and you that an unknown man has a gun to her father's head back at the Temple of Light. Hannah rips a hammer from a nearby sculpture and runs up to the temple. Annoyingly, you cannot run for whatever reason I don't know you overhear the strange man telling Hannah that if she does not come with him her father will die and yeah her father gets shot and Hannah hits the strange man in the head and yep he dead the next day a funeral is being held where the golden acorn is being planted Hannah is obviously distraught that the fellow monks do nothing but see it as a, oh just another day on the job suddenly Teresa appears at the end of the funeral and explains that the man had been sent by Lord Lucian and that Hannah needs to come with Teresa to pretty much avenge her father. That's when Hannah grabs Teresa's hand and tells her to call her Hammer instead. They wish back to the Heroes Guild on the search for the next hero, the hero of Will. What kind of niggles me about this is that at the beginning Teresa tells you that they needed to get Hammer a good reason to fight and it makes me suss about Teresa. There's always been a bit of contention about whether Teresa is evil or not but when we finally talk about her real story, the beginning of her story, I think it'll be clear as to why she is the way she is. I actually played the second Fable, then the third, then finally the first game. And I actually weirdly like how I did that because a lot of my questions were answered. And I don't know, I liked how I went about it that way. But anyway, we also make our way back to the Heroes Guild where we are told by Teresa about the great Will user Garth. Remember that mysterious man back in the castle at the beginning with the glowing tattoos? It's revealed that Garth used to work with Lucian researching the Old Kingdom's technologies. He thought that Lucian's research was purely academic. Unbeknownst to him, until stuff got heavy, it wasn't. I believe it was that night when you saw Garth as a child that they had an argument and he left. Teresa tells you where to find Garth. He lives in an old tower in Brightwood. Even further away we go. As we make it through Brightwood fighting off Hobbs and bandits, we make it to the tower only to find spy guards, Lucian's henchmen, as well as more strange looking men. Pretty much it looks like they have spikes in their heads, kind of like a mix of Lady Gaga and a porcupine, but also a floating shard. A piece of the spire is there. It's a old kingdom technology. You'll hear that a lot. It attacks you with beams of light and it also is used to teleport more of Lucian's henchmen wherever he wants. When you finally make it to the top of the tower, it's all blocked off and burning. You cannot reach Garth to help him. But then Garth is taken by the Commandant that we meet later on. When we make our way back to the Heroes Guild, feeling defeated and at a loss, Teresa informs us about the Crucible. One of the funner parts of the game, kind of like a comedic break, I guess. And the Crucible kind of is like uh, the Olympia fighting stadium in Greece. But you have to go through eight rounds of senseless violence and it's great. I love it. But anyway, but each person who wins is recruited as a guard or a slave for Lucian. You, Sparrow, have to defeat those eight rounds so you can go to the Spire, prison break Garth. It's pretty sick, not gonna lie. But the way to Westcliff, where the Crucible was held, is a treacherous one. It's crawling with bandits, being as though the journey is through the bandit coast, not to mention other vicious creatures and highwaymen. Hammer makes her way to the Colorskate, which is pretty much like a teleporter, and tells you to meet her in Brightwood to make your way to Westcliff. Also, Hammer is a very kind of like upbeat and cheeky kind of woman. I really like her character actually. Now, not much happens throughout the coast other than meeting another creature to fight. Balverines, pretty much werewolves with bat-like faces. You and Hammer kick their furry butts along with the bandits alike and you end up meeting a distressed young woman howling on the road, mind the foreshadowing, over her mister who had just been slaughtered. You and Hammer are tasked with getting safely through howling halls, fighting off Balverines and having a rather creepy time. It spooked me a little bit. You see like shadows of the Balverines on the walls like crawling around and I really like that part. Only when you reach a rather big room at the end of the hall the woman turns to you both and surprise she's a Balverine, a queen Balverine. Her voice ends up turning into this really grotesque sound and she tells her children that she brought them food. That would be you. You fight her and her little Balverine minions off and you make your way finally to Westcliff and the Crucible. Westcliff is a small town filled with poverty, criminals and thugs. You also run into another old friend from Bowstone, Old Town. Someone you haven't seen since you were a child. Our thesaurus hero, Barnum. 
always looking for the next big thing to make moolah. He invented the camera, by the way. He wants a large sum of gold so he can turn Westcliff into a beautiful village one day, and he'll gather the interest back one day, of course. This is purely a side quest, but it's another example of how your actions can change the world around you. But anyway, but you and Hammer go to the Crucible, and depending on how well you, Sparrow, are known, depends on whether or not you get in immediately. So side quest time. But of course, Hammer pees off one of the commentators, and she's not allowed in, and of course, nor is your dog. Yes, also the dog is still alive. He helps you you dig stuff up and bite things in the neck. Best dog ever. You enter into the Crucible's foyer and meet some pretty interesting characters. Those out there that actually play the game, y'all remember Golgoron, little shapeshifter with the deep voice, actually looks like a little girl. I'll leave that for the rest of you to find out one day if you can. But before you enter the actual arena, you can buy some new weapons and potions. And might I add, the weapons in Fable 2 and the original Fable were bloody ace. In Fable 3, there's barely any unique weapons like Where's my bloody cleaver and shiny rock on a stick? Anyway, that's by the by. You have to defeat, like I said earlier, eight rounds of creatures and bandits, and it's glorious fun. And also, if you do it in a certain time frame, you can win a pretty cool weapon, but this video is already really flipping long. You have to defeat things from Balverines to Hobbs to Hollow Men to Highwaymen. It's a whole ordeal, and it's really fun. But anyway, once you've won the Crucible, now you have to go to the Spire, Lucian's Domain. Teresa speaks to you through the Guild Seal and lets you know that you need to get your things in order before you go. So yeah, once again, side quest. You and Hammer and your faithful dog make it down to the docks of Westcliff. Hammer promises to take care of your dog no matter how long it takes and you hop onto the ship. A really dark and cool cutscene plays of the ship making its way into the spire and it really gives you an idea of how large the structure is and a lot of foreboding doom. You and a whole bunch of other people get off the ships and walk, well, are mainly pushed by the guards towards a much older Lucian at the steps of the spire. You make a friend named creatively, Bob, who's so excited to get sent a letter home from his beloved, ah oh man, poor Bob. But then Lucian starts his speech. He explains that his plan is now to cleanse the world of all its evils. So yeah, reviving his daughter and wife isn't his priority anymore. He demands that when you are under his command, you must obey or face the consequences. Suddenly, you're in your bug room. You're now bold if you had hair in the first place, wearing a headband, a shock collar, and a new spired guard attire. A higher up guard explains that you're needed by the Commandant. Remember the spiky boy that stole Garth up? Yeah, him. Enter the Commandant's room and he explains how the collar around your neck will torture you and remove your XP. The Commandant hits you and demands you to obey and thank him. You can choose to pretty much flip him the bird or thank him. This, of course, has an impact on your moral standing. Later on, you see Garth in a prison chamber. He tells you he knows who you are and that you have to be patient and wait for the opportunity to strike. And during this time you have in the Spire, why I said poor Bob earlier, and I forgot to put this actually in the script, was the fact that Bob slowly kind of goes a little bit cuckoo, and he explains that the humming of the Spire is as familiar as his own heartbeat. He is a very, like, studious guard and everything, but then you're ordered to go to the Commandant's room, where you see Bob slowly humming and talking to himself on the floor. The Commandant tells you that he's pretty much useless and that you have to kill him, and he hands you a sword. And of course, you can choose to kill Bob, which is awful, why would you do that to poor Bob? Or, I guess you could put him out of his misery, but that's not cool, don't do that. <laughs> or, you could hit the Commandant, or you could just choose not to hit anyone. And of course, that will um, change your moral standing. But obviously, if you do not choose to obey the Commandant, you will lose more and more of your XP. And that's really important for unlocking new skills, which I probably should have mentioned. So obviously will, skill and strength, all that kind of stuff, and unlocks new abilities such as being able to shoot for a longer distance or aim at different body parts, which is pretty fun, not gonna lie. Different spells, like I said earlier, raising the dead or force push. I think teleportation's one, but that might be from the first game. I can't remember. And strength, just you could change your physique, how healthy you are, how big your health bar is, that kind of stuff. Anyway, I digress. A cutscene plays and Teresa narrates the following. An unloved task slows the passage of time, an eternity passed within the spire each day, and the great walls grew bigger. Each dawn grew darker in their shadows, and the deeds within the walls grew darker still. As years passed, the hero's task seemed more impossible. Garth remained hidden, and others like the Commandant appeared all as brutal and powerful as the first. And slowly, all thought of freedom, all the outside world faded. 
Talk about disheartening, eh? Gets dark. <laughs> about 10 years pass. Lucian has mostly rebuilt the spire with his slaves, and you, Sparrow, are still trapped. You're commanded to go find a missing guard in one of the wings. Only when you reach the dead guard, you're zapped by Garth. He breaks your shot colour off with the last of his focused will. You and Garth take the spire by storm. You end up in another boss battle with the commandant, and it's actually a pain in the ass, but I loved it. But when you do, Garth sucks up all of the XP that the guards lose, and you escape with the new people arriving from the crucible. In a really wholesome moment, you arrive at the dock of Oakfield. I think the best place to arrive back to as well, because it's so cute and wholesome there. Teresa hands you your effects, your dog gives you a good old cuddle, and then Teresa persuades a strong-willed Garth to come back with her to the Heroes Guild. You're told by Teresa that Hammer is in the tavern in Rookridge, so of course you go to meet her. But if you have a family before the spire, you can go visit them too. They don't seem to mind your 10 year absence. Also, you age in this game, so you will notice you look a tad bit older. Hammer is super excited to see you after the 10 year hiatus, but you both head to the guild. Teresa tells you that you only need the last hero, the ever elusive pirate reader, the hero of skill. So, shooting stuff. And he resides in the beachside pirate town, Bloodstone. Garth suggests that they venture back to his tower in Brightwood because it has a colour skate that can teleport them to Bloodstone. When Hammer, Garth and Sparrow arrive at the tower, Garth tries to reconnect the colour skate whilst you and Hammer smash up some more of Lucian's guards, which have pretty much taken refuge at the tower being as though he did escape. Unfortunately, only you and your dog can make it through the colour skate before it breaks. But we subsequently ended up in the spookiest location in the whole of the story. Wraith Marsh. And I'm fine with it now, but back in the day, did I ever speed run through that area? It's so dang spooky. You, after collapsing down through the color skate, are captured by some creepy old bugger who locks you in a cage, but the fog swells in. He panics and runs into the fog and you hear a deathly screech of a scream, followed by the man's blood curdling pleads to let him go. He dared now. Your dog runs up with the keys and lets you out. Side note, my first playthrough, this moment was when I discovered how your deeds can also impact your appearance. My person had a halo, but yeah, if you are evil, you will grow horns and become, I guess, ugly. Anyway, I digress. But Wraith Marsh has a sad and rich history. As Teresa explains through the Guild Seal, this place used to be Oakvale, a little town. Over a hundred years ago, one of the villagers made a deal with an evil force, the Shadow Court. All the people of Oakvale had to pay that price with their lives and we soon get to meet him. Going through Wraith Marsh is pretty fun because you get to defeat many a hollow man and they are so satisfying to flog. Only you meet a new foe, Banshees. They surround you in fog and whisper horrible things to you to drain your strength. Well, mental strength. It's more annoying, but I'll talk more about Oakvale if we do an original Fable video. We finally make it to the town of Bloodstone after making our way through Wraith Marsh and now we're finally on our way to meet Reaver, the hero of skill. As we meet Reaver in his mansion on top of the hill of Bloodstone, he tells you to take a hike because you're not well known enough. So what do we do people? We do some side quests in Bloodstone. We help an old pirate clear his name by defeating a ghost ship filled with ghost pirates. We pose for some sculptures, rid the town of a banshee. You know, all in a day's work. When you return to Reaver, he gives you a task to go to the Shadow Court that I mentioned earlier to return a seal like the guild seal, but spooky. When we defeat the shadows and make our way into the actual shadow court in Wraith Marsh, we are made aware that Reaver is a culprit behind the downfall of Oakvale. He sacrificed the people and their youth so he could essentially become immortal. He let them destroy Oakvale. He has to continue to sacrifice lives in order for him to live. Bit rude, to be honest. Which leads to our next test in morality. A young and distressed woman is crying. She was teleported there by reading out something in an old book and you can choose to keep the seal, which will weaken you and aid you. Or it can give you something like gnarly pink eye. Or you can give it to the girl. So yeah, that's up to y'all. I've played both sides of the morality field. Not gonna lie, it doesn't really do much other than do your appearance one. I don't really care. But we return to Bloodstone no matter what our choice is and once again meet Reaver in his back room. Oh yeah, quickly, let's jump back to Westcliff for a minute. 
we can see how Barnum has completely reinvigorated it into a nice little town. It's really great. He also gives you a few thousand gold in interest too, so that's a good investment. But the reason I bring this up is because he's taking Reva's photo. Good old Barnum. But when Reva finds out the picture will take three months to develop, he shoots Barnum right in front of us, our long-term pal and business partner. Pretty saddening moment, to be honest. Reva, being a doubled-crossing bastard, turns to us and explains nully that Lucian had put a bounty on her heads with a nice sum of gold. Only poor dumb Reva doesn't realise that Lucian wants Reva too, for he is one of the three heroes needed for the spire to work. You see where this is all going? So he in turn is double crossed. Lucian's men are on a destroying bloodstone and finding the hero's rampage. Luckily you and Reva escape through the escape tunnel and make your way to the beach where Garth and Hammer have been sent by Teresa to wait. The escape ship is pulling up only for it to explode. You, Garth, Hammer and Reva have to go up against a huge piece of the spire, a shard like before, as well as waves and waves of Lucian's men. This is pretty much the last boss battle and, and definitely the best one, a lot of fun. Garth finally destroys the giant shard and you all make your way back to Hero's Hill in Bower Lake where we started our journey in the gypsy camp. Teresa makes the heroes stand in a sequence so they can perform a ritual to create the weapon to defeat Lucian. As the ritual ends, a massive blast goes off and all the heroes are now on the ground and Teresa has disappeared. Lucian is suddenly there with his men and he pulls a gun on you and states, The last time I killed you, it tore my heart out. The saddest part of this whole game occurs. Your faithful companion and loving doggo jumps in front of Lucian's bullet. He drops dead. Lucian fires again and shoots you in the head. A huge flash of light happens and we are awakened by our older sister Rose. Sparrow, you are a child again. You're back in your childhood home and you go around the farm shooting bottles that Rose set up for you and kicking the chickens back into their coop. You spend a whole day with her and it's a really lovely segment of the game and something that's always stood out to me a lot. But you and Rose's parents are nowhere to be seen but are apparently out. But as the day draws a close, Rose tells you it's time for bed. As you sleep, you are once again awakened by the same music from the music box from Mergo. You follow the music out of your farm's gate as Rose screams for you to stay. As you follow the path, the sky turns a dark red and you are surrounded by corpses. You make your way down the path and at the end you find the music box again. As you hold on to the music box, a cutscene plays and it shows you yourself from time periods in your life. From a little one to yourself now as an adult, Teresa says to you that you have the weapon now. You suddenly teleport back to the spire where we find Lucian draining Hammer, Garth and Reva of their powers so he can finally make his wish. He starts to suck your power away but use the music box to drain all of the power out of Lucian. He drops down and so do all of the heroes. Lucian pleads that he only wanted to do what was right. He wanted to rid the world of all its evils. He preaches on and on and if you so choose you can kill him. But if you take your time, Reva does it for you with a sorry did you want to kill him? I love British humour don't you? Lucian is dead. You did what you set out to do, but there's one more thing you end up having to choose. This game is a game of choices. A Teresa appears and she proclaims that the Spire can grant one wish. She gives you three choices. Rose can be heard telling you that you shouldn't be afraid and that it's alright. The three choices are sacrifice. All of the people who die in the making of the Spire will be resurrected and brought back to their families. Love. Pretty much you can bring back your dog and your family if you had one which were unfortunately killed by Lucian. It's also said that Rose can also be brought back this way. And the last choice, wealth, more gold than you can ever imagine. These choices all come at a price, but whatever you choose, you receive a letter. But I'll tell you the one you get for choosing love, as it's probably what I'd selfishly choose. You receive a letter from Rose and it reads, I woke up today in such a peculiar place. It's like a great big forest with lots and lots of trees that go on forever. I was scared at first because I couldn't find you, but there's someone here who says he knows us. He says he knows our family. He told me his name, but I keep forgetting it. Weird. I think he's a king or something. He's very thin and wears a hood and looks scary, but he's nice and I feel safe with him here. I hope you're okay, little sparrow. Somehow I know that it's all going to be all right and we'll be together again one day. He promised me. Love, Rose. Cue the teary boys. There's some story about who Rose has ended up with, which I'll have to touch on another day, but there's also theories about where she is and what time she even wrote this letter. But what some think is that she is in a faraway land with this man and she has come back to life. Well, I hope she has. 
After you make your wish, you are told by Teresa that the spire is hers and that you better GTFO, mate. Lots of people think she's the master of it all and I really want to research that more myself. But the hero story didn't just end there and in no way did I even touch the full extent of the story. Fable has such a rich lore and it's brought me joy for nine years now and I'm still finding out new things. It's genuinely pretty cool. But yes, I'm sorry I've been behind videos. Life has been so hectic. But either way guys, I hope this made you want to go out and play Fable or even play in this gypsy camp in The Sims where we started this journey. I gotta get going though guys. I hope you enjoyed this video but remember to just like, subscribe, tick that bell and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!